Welcome to Thrive Spice. Our guest today is Mayuko Okai, a registered dietitian, yoga teacher, and founder of Food Liberation, a coaching program that helps mindful individuals heal their relationship with food and body. While working eight years across hospitals in Los Angeles, Mayuko pursued yoga teacher training, which opened the doors to a world of healing she had yet to explore. This inspired her to leave her career to shift her nutrition practice, incorporating mindfulness techniques with a focus on emotional care. Today, Mayuko takes delight in guiding clients internationally to find food freedom so that they can live their full lives. In 2021, she founded a scholarship to help provide accessible services to teenagers. Mayuko can be found practicing Ashtanga yoga, eating to her heart's desire, and spending time in the countryside of Japan where she now resides. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Good. So this is actually our first international episode of Thrive Spice. So I'm really excited to, uh, <laughs> to be do starting that with you. Oh, um, great. So welcome, Mayuko. We're, yeah. we're so happy to have you here today. And I'm just so excited to learn more about your personal journey. And I want to start off with just talking a little bit about, I know this is a really deep topic for those of us in the community, which is body image and Asian culture. And I wanted to st take a step back and share some um, research as well as my own personal experience before we dive in. And uh, we've seen that women with a positive body image are more likely to have good mental health, which seems to make sense. But many women in the US and around the world have negative body image, which can, which can put them at a higher risk of depression, eating disorders, or other mental and physical health problems. And then when we look at Asian American women, a study published in Clinical Psychology Re Review found that in comparison to white women, Asian women actually exhibited higher levels of disordered eating behavior, such as excessive weight and dieting concerns, restrictive eating and body dissatisfaction, as well as having a smaller ideal body and reported weight. So thinking about that and reflecting on my own experience, I've also struggled to bridge the cultural pressure of East Asian culture to be thin, particularly through my pregnancy and postpartum journeys where I gained and lost a lot of weight in a short amount of time. But I do remember understanding from even a young age that a thin body signals beauty, success, and desirability, even as a daughter, a wife, and a mother. Yeah, there is this contradictory familial pressure to eat everything that's placed in front of you, finish every last grain of rice, or you're considered like rude and disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And even when we're not around our families, I find that it can also carry over to social environments that I've been in with other Asian American women, where we seem to internalize and act as both sides of this contradiction. For example, we might participate in casual negative body self-talk, including saying stuff like, oh, I have to go run five miles after I eat this, or I feel so fat, or, oh, I really shouldn't eat that kind of stuff. There's this pressure of FOMO and eating whatever we want, but then on the other side, there's also this pressure to be thin no matter what. So I'm really curious to hear your perspective on how media, family, and our cultural values and diet culture affect our own mental health. And what impact does this have on our relationship with food and ourselves? Yeah, and that's such a loaded topic, but such a great one. And I will speak on what I can based off of my observation. It's growing up in an Asian household in the U.S., so my parents uh, came from Japan. Well, we came from Japan. And so I think, first of all, diet culture is huge everywhere, right? So we're all affected by how we should look, right? We're told at a very young age that we need to look a certain way and we need to eat a certain way. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not blatantly said out loud, if we're looking at makeup brands, clothing brands, it's all about being a certain size, which is thinner than what most people are naturally, or having flawless skin, having perfect eyebrows and lips and, you know, it's everything. And all of this, we are just subconsciously brainwashed, basically, to 
fit into this mold. Like we need to look a certain way. We need to be smaller, right? And I think especially in Asian culture, because Asians tend to be a smaller frame and in a country like Japan, where most people living in Japan are Japanese. So we're not, I'm in Japan right now, but you look outside, you go outside and everyone is Japanese and generally around the same size. So if you are slightly larger than that, then maybe maybe you're lazy, maybe you're eating too much, maybe there's something wrong with you. And this is a conformist society, right? Everyone wants to be the same way. Everyone wants to look the same way. You don't want to stand out. And so I think that's a huge problem. And what I do appreciate about the U.S. is diversity is embraced. We are now expanding what beauty looks like in terms of color, in terms of body size, and having workouts and yoga classes that are more accessible, right? So that's a really great movement, but there's still so much pressure to be in this ideal body weight, which is not realistic for most people. And... So I think, yeah, I think diet culture is huge. And also there's that Asian family, <laughs> right? So I don't know what it is. It's when I observe non-Asian families in the U.S., I'm like, wow, like there's so much emotional connection, right? Parents are encouraging their children to speak their mind, to share what they're feeling. They're touchy-feely. They hug and kiss. And I love you. I love you every single day. <laughs> I've never said that to my parents, right? Not that I'm, that, not that I need that. We get love and attention in different ways. And that's just a different style of communication. But I personally haven't had that emotional, that space to share emotional connections or just what's going on with my life personally. What am I going through? How is my mental health? Am I happy? Like that's not a conversation on the table, but that's my personal experience. So I think if there was more room to speak about emotions, to point out mental health, and to accept and embrace who you are as a person and not having all of these expectations, societal expectations of beauty standards, but also family expectations of how we need to look, what success means. We need to go to a good school and then have a career and all of this. We, we're like set up for this path, right? That's like a lot of Asian families, I think based off of my experience. I think generally we're, we are moving towards a positive direction, but that's where we are coming from. And that's why there's so many people with disordered eating or orthorexia, meaning being obsessed with being, or obsessed with being healthy. So eating well and exercising, but that ignores, ignores your stress, that ignores mental health in order to look skinny, which we attribute to being healthy, which is not true. Yeah, these are all such great points. And to your point, it, it is a very loaded topic. And I found it really interesting when you were reflecting on family experiences, when you know, you're know you observing other families that are outside of the Asian experience. Not that the Asian experience is a monolith, but I definitely can recall that same feeling. And I think there is this very powerful connection between emotion and food. You mentioned that not hearing I love you or just not hearing the verbalization of, or encouragement of expressing our emotions and mental health. That is very interesting how it manifests in our relationship with food and our bodies. How do you think we can free ourselves to enjoy a healthy relationship with food and our own self-esteem and our bodies? Yeah, and if we can back up to that Asian culture, just I, I know I'm just generalizing, but in the U.S., there's a lot of independence that's encouraged, right? But in Asian cultures, it's about the collective, right? So are you doing something for the family? Are you thinking about the family? 
right? Your success is your family's success. And so for me, I found it very challenging to be on this path, which is a very standard path. I was living in a bubble and I didn't have my own opinions. And when I found my own opinions growing up, when I became an adult, I started questioning the way that my path, my career, my opinions. So I had to break free from that. And it was hard. Well, what would my parents think, right? And I left my career and that was a big deal, right? And I still have those voices hanging over my head constantly. If I think of a non-popular opinion or this path that's not traditional, well, what would my parents say? Yeah. So I think first of all, it's really about knowing who you are, knowing your path, whether that's your dream, your purpose, uh, your value, your core values, being very clear with that, I think is important and know that that's worthy, mm -hmm. right? That you don't have to live for someone else because that doesn't lead to happiness. And then, so I think body image and the way we eat and the way we take care of ourselves is the same thing is trying to lose weight serving you, right? Or are you just in this toxic cycle and just pushing yourself until you are so stressed out and you're just killing yourself over, over what, right? To lose a few pounds, to look a certain way so that your family accepts you or that you're attractive. And yeah, I think it's just, first of all, first step is to be clear and to communicate with your body. I'm all about knowing your path, knowing your, who you are, and communicating with your body, listening, instead of listening to external sources, external information, meaning diet culture, not being persuaded by diet industry, or at least be conscious about how you are being influenced or brainwashed and knowing what's true to you. What is your family saying? What is the societal expectation, right? Is that aligned with you? You have a natural body and what's going to serve you is to take care of your natural body in the way that it works for you. And it's good for your mental health as well. I really love that because I think what you're describing with everyone else's standards, whether it's family or society, it's such a moving target, right? Like you think you get there and then you're like, surprise, I need to lose another X number of pounds or I need to be this size or something like that. Whereas if you set your own um, core values and your standards and really align yourself with who you are, that target is going to stay fixed and it's not going to be something that is constantly out of reach. And I think that's so interesting because in this time where we live in, where especially when it comes to losing weight, everything is tracked within an inch of its life, where, whether it's the steps you take or, you know, there's all these data and apps that really just generate so much information on how you might be living this healthier life. And so I'm curious what led you to your own personal journey into intuitive eating and mindfulness, which is such a dichotomy from this data-driven, saturated industry of diet culture. And what has it been like to build a community around mindful nutrition and emotional self-care? Yes, great question, thank you. So my path, I'm a registered dietitian and I'm also now a yoga teacher. So I worked in healthcare for eight years and it was this very standard path. And I, from the beginning, I just did not feel aligned with it. It just wasn't the way that I could help people. I didn't feel that my services was actually changing people's lives and making them healthier. I was just giving information what you should be eating, what you shouldn't be eating. It was just, this: these are good foods, these are bad foods based off of your medical condition, okay? And we're more than that, right? We have emotions, we exhibit behaviors, and we have routines, and we have culture. Who's to just come into your room and say, hey, eat these foods, don't eat these foods, 
you can't just change like that. And so I struggled with that for a long time and I came across yoga. And when I went into teacher training, that's when my life shifted. That's when I was able to find my truth to really realize that I'm misaligned and that if I don't take my life into my own hands, I am just going to be very miserable or continue to be miserable. And so I left, started teaching yoga, which incorporates you know, mindfulness and being true to yourself and connecting with your body. And then when I came across intuitive eating, I found that that was the perfect integration of mindfulness and yoga and the nutrition world, which is my background. So this was, it was such an aha moment. And it felt like, wow, this is where I can help people. There are so many people that are struggling with food and they're not necessarily diagnosed as eating disorder. So they're not going to the hospital or anything. They're not getting any treatment. They're just living their day to day and struggling inside. They can't do the things that they love because they don't want to gain weight or they're unhappy with their body. They don't want to get more compliments about the way they look, or not compliments, comments about the way they look or suggestions to lose weight. And that's also present in uh, the medical field. There's a weight stigma. The way doctors um, treat their patients is different based off of how they appear, based off of their weight. And that's bias, that's discrimination. Right? Not based off of medical conditions, but based off of weight. Right? And so that's how I came to intuitive eating. It's just such a mindful way to approach your body. It's a yogic way to, to eat and to take care of yourself. And it's very holistic, meaning we, we look at all aspects of your life. At least in my program, we look at what is your support system like? What are your relationships like? How is your work-life balance? Right? It's all connected. We can't just look at food. We can't just look at nutrition and say, this is right, this is wrong, right? It's not about the calories. We're completely removing numbers, weight and calories and protein, all of these things. It doesn't, it's not really that important, especially if you are trying to heal your relationship with food. That's not where we should be looking at. So that's how I came to intuitive eating and building this Food Liberation, which is my program, has been, I don't know, it has been so rewarding working in healthcare and working with thousands of patients, dozens of patients, a dozen patients every day, and not feeling like I'm helping anybody, and now working with people and really getting to know them and seeing their transformations, seeing them become free from diet culture, free from their own minds. It's just such a rewarding feeling knowing that I'm able to help someone. Even if I'm not helping thousands of people at this point, even if it's a handful, I'm making a difference and I'm helping someone not just change the way that they view food and their body, but the way they live, right? making sure that they are aligned with who they are, embracing their core values so that they can spend their time and energy doing all of the things that they love. So I'm really grateful that I have been able to create this path and uh, create this program. Yeah, I can see the joy on your face when you talk about <laughs> this community and this world you've built. And it also brings me a lot of joy to see that. <laughs> I can see that. Um, and I can relate to that too, right? Because the work that we do when we build a community is very healing and seeing others transform their own, as you mentioned, like prisons, <laughs> escaping out of the prisons of our own negative thinking or ways of trapping ourselves in ways that don't serve us. That is so healing to see others discover that, become aware of it, and really evaluate their lives holistically, as you said. And a lot of it sounds like, honestly, just common sense, right? As you mentioned, we can't view diet and our bodies as a silo. There's all these other factors in our lives, whether it's relationships and work and sleep and stress uh, that really play a big role. And it seems like 
the more science studies this, the more they confirm that it's not just about yeah calories and all that. It's definitely a multifaceted ecosystem. And I think that it's really progressive, but at the same time, refreshingly basic, <laughs> the way you're approaching eating and in our bodies. I saw a glimpse of your uh, mindfulness retreats and they look amazing. Particularly, I noticed the spread of food on the table and being Asian, like I'm always all about like what's on the table to eat. So tell me a little bit more about that. They look incredible and I just want to hear more about what that experience is like. Yeah, thank you for asking. I had my first retreat this past weekend. Right. Um, in <laughs> thank you. It was in the like the mountains and nature -y resort area in Japan, and uh, basically it's a way for people to connect to the, their body and experience intuitive eating, so that they can start making changes in their lives and connect to their bodies. So we ate. We did yoga. We talked, we shared, and one main part of this was mindful eating, which I always encourage anyone to do. If you do one thing out of intuitive eating, it's mindful eating. Even if you have a healthy relationship with your body, even if you're happy. And so what we did was we ate in silence and we took one bite at a time. And this is the food that we had was so delicious. It was all locally grown food and prepared. And, and so every bite, we would take our time to chew and notice the flavors and textures and our body's response to it. And going slow, it's just such a different experience than just like shoving food down like we normally do watching Netflix or talking, engaging in other things. We're looking at external um, stimulus or external, just, we're just looking outside. So we go in by looking, going and eating slowly. So that was really great. And everyone had different experiences and realizations through that. And it was just a really great way to experience mindfulness in different aspects. So we washed the dishes mindfully. We did walking meditations. We did restorative yoga. And then we got into the hot springs at the, oh, at the lodge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was just this very relaxing, yet enriching, supportive environment in nature, we're surrounded by these beautiful mountains and trees. And yeah, it was, it was really beautiful. And we were planning to continue to have them on a regular basis. So I'm really looking forward to this new challenge that I have now that I'm in Japan. And, you know, it's different. People, I, the people here, they're looking for maybe different things and different types of opportunities. And intuitive eating is it's not known in Japan. The book is not translated. So I, I think part of my role is to share that here. For sure. I love that you mentioned this exercise of slowing down and really tasting and enjoying our food because having worked in corporate environments in New York City for many years, I've witnessed the midtown lunch like shoveling routine where <laughs> everyone's just shoveling the food into their face and looking at their phone at the same time. Like no one has tasted their food. No one knows what they ate. Like it's just a complete lack of mindfulness. And there's this pressure of you can't take a lunch break. You have to eat at your desk. Mm -hmm. You need to be doing something. You need to be productive. So I think that it's also connected with this pressure to be productive at the same time, that we, we need to be so productive that eating and sleeping and just basic human wellness functions are just considered an optionality in terms of yeah. basic self-care. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is such a great lesson. And I love that you mentioned that because I've also been trying to do that instead of looking at my phone or reading something or watching TV, I just eat. And I find that I'm actually quicker at eating 
when I do that, then if I'm reading something, if I read something, I end up, my lunch takes like 45 minutes and I don't finish my lunch. So I'm just working instead of actually eating. So I, I really love that. And I definitely wish I could be at one of your retreats. I'd love to come sometime. And Oh, I would love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I definitely see a market for that in terms of just people wanting to get away and almost like an antidote to the stresses of modern day life with all of the technology and obviously recovering from this pandemic, um, really craving that human connection and just a slower pace that's more mindful and appreciative of just everyday joys like eating. I want to switch gears a little bit. And, and you mentioned, of course, you moved to Japan recently. And I can only imagine that that's come with its own set of transitions and maybe even a bit of culture shock. And as entrepreneurs and as women, we're often sold this idea of, as you mentioned earlier, this linear path of checking the boxes in terms of beauty, money, and fame as a pathway to happiness, as well as finding a nice Asian husband or buying a house, <laughs> having children. We know the drill, like everything our grandparents and our parents tell us over and over again. And it's almost like this abundance trap. So how are you defining success and happiness on your own terms, particularly as someone who's recently moved to a new country and started a new business or pivoted and a new relationship as well? Yeah. I mean, I have definitely fallen victim to this trap. This is abundance trap. You know, I thought leaving my career was the step and moving towards this these all of these goals that seems glamour glamorous but when i got too far into it i realized wow like i'm struggling i'm like my mental health is struggling and where am i right and i realized this isn't the way i wanted to work i wanted to really be true to myself and that's why i left my career and if i need to be true to myself I need to let go of some of these goals that are, I'm not going to say they're not attainable. It's attainable, but I'm not sure if it's attainable exactly in the same way for me. And so I really had to take a step back and assess the situation and letting go of expectations again. This time it wasn't societal expectation or parental expectation. This was expectation in this entrepreneurial bubble. And I like to compare this to dieting, right? So this entrepreneurial path is like, okay, if you hustle, you can be successful and make this much money and be completely free. You can be financially free by 40 or whatever, right? That's similar to saying you can have the skinny body and as long as you work out a lot and you don't eat too much, you can get there. How many of how many people are successful in dieting? Very, very little, right? How many people are successful in entrepreneurship, right? And of course, there's different types of success. But I'm here, we're talking about that financial success of becoming um, this millionaire so that you don't ever have to work again. You don't ever have to be bound by whatever it is. And so this was for me a really nice opportunity for me to redefine success. I mean, I always knew what that success was, but I had to be like, hey, let's come back. Let's regroup here. And success, of course, is being happy and loving what I do. That's my success, right? And if I can do all of the things I love and to be able to support myself through that, I think that's, I think I'm going to be so happy and without feeling worried whether if I'm going to make it or not, that path, that struggle, you know, is that really the direction or the style is, that I want to work? No, I want to be content. I want to be grounded in every step of the way. I want to be connected to my purpose. I want it to be connected to my core values. 
every day. Not That's not my end goal. That's not a few years later. And I'm just going to hustle until I get there. I want to be connected to that on a regular basis, on a daily basis. And so it's really hard because there's so much noise. As soon as you go on social media, that's what's like in front of you. And it's easy to be persuaded in that direction. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying it's evil. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I think there are people who are able to do it and that works for them. But I think that for me personally, that's not necessarily the way that I want to go, right? So I want to really figure out how I want to work in my own way. And I'm finding different opportunities in Japan and I've only been here for several months. And so I want to be open to all of these possibilities, even if it weren't part of the plan or if it's not directly bringing in financial abundance, right? But if I can appreciate that and take care of each opportunity that comes my way, as long as it's aligned with my work and my passion, then I think that's the way to be. And we talked about relationships last time and yes, and yes, I'm, I'm expected to start a family and have this ideal partner and everything and which I thought I would be doing as well, <laughs> you know, but at the same time with a new partner who did not fit my box, my ideal, wasn't in my ideal standard or model or whatever, it really challenged my perspectives again. And he is someone who isn't on a career path or aspirational or following a dream like, like I am. And at first I questioned that, oh, what is it like to not have a dream, to not be motivated? That's, that's below me, right? That was my initial judgment and criticism. But then I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm thinking this way. He's happy. He's grounded. And he's not worried about the future. He's living every day in the moment. And there's so much contentment. And, and where am I? I'm worried. I don't know if I'm going to be able to follow my dream or to reach that goal. And it's just, I think it's really helping me to live in the moment and to be happy with the way I am and to enjoy the work I'm doing, even if I'm still in the stages of just taking one step in front of the other, even if I'm not near that success, quote unquote success, every step of the way is something I want to be really a part of and be connected to that. So that's something that I've recently learned and learning to embrace. Wow. I thank you for sharing that. I think it's such a sign of personal growth, which is hard and not comfortable and confusing at times. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right there with you in some moments, right? <laughs> we think that we want certain things. And when we get there, we're like, oh, wait a minute, this I, I'm not happy or this isn't what I pictured. And I love how you describe that tension between having this plan. We grow up, we're it's brainwashed into our heads. Have this five-year plan, have a 10-year plan. What's your business plan? We have to have a plan. And then when things like the pandemic come and life happens, we have to all of a sudden be very resilient and pivot and all of a sudden we're out of our comfort zone. And I think that that's what the upside has been of the pandemic and just seeing all, all these people uprooted and having their plans change because all of a sudden, you know, the word that I focused on as I was listening to you was do what I do. So do being present tense and that's all you can focus on right now. And it's so in line with what you're talking about with that mindfulness and the intuition and just really slowing down to observe the micro moments in our lives because 
as we know, if we don't pay attention, they just fly on by and we don't know how half of the year has already um, flown by. And I think with your relationship, it's also so refreshing to hear that too, right? Because from a very young age, we're conditioned, you know, find a successful, nice partner who is a high income earner and checks all the boxes and has their own plan of five to a hundred years for success. And right. it is a lot of pressure. And I think that the fact that you sat with your discomfort around that and questioned it is really inspiring, I think, for a lot of us, because life tends to not follow what we think it's going to be. And then when we're like, oh, no, this isn't what I wanted. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, but I'm happy. And why? <laughs> and so uh, we, I think that's such a, a helpful perspective to just zoom out and take a look and think about, okay, well, what does this mean? And why am I uncomfortable? And I think a lot of us could definitely benefit from that and re-examining how we define success and happiness and all of that. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. We've also spoken about taking mental health breaks before. So I want to ask, because it was fun, kind of funny, we were both in alignment with taking a mental health day a couple of years ago. <laughs> and I wanted to ask what your own mental health and wellness routine are, and how do you thrive in a time of uncertainty or change? And do you feel like it's okay to be in survival mode sometimes and thrive at other times? Absolutely. Uh, survival mode is nature. That's what animals do. That's what humans do. And yes, this past year has been difficult for most people. And to be in survival mode, yes, that's what, that's just what we do. And it's okay. It's okay to be experiencing hardship and experiencing uncertainty, right? And it's just such a great time for us to reflect. So my mental health routines, a few weeks ago when I was telling you I took that break, it was around my menstrual cycle. So as women, we need to be cognizant that we're not consistent people and our moods fluctuate, our hormone, hormones and our needs, our needs for food types and our sleep hours may vary. We might need to take a day off and that's okay to honor that. So I think I took, <laughs> this was, this is a hard month and I took four days. It was a four day weekend for me and I came out of it feeling really great. And so I let myself not do anything. It's like, yep, I'm not going to work and it's okay. Right. So setting boundaries, I think is a huge part of taking care of yourself, whether that's going through your journey with food, sometimes you are going to be in survival mode and that's completely, completely okay. And it's not normal to not have those moments. Right now, I'm taking a social media break. It's been a few days and it's just really nice to cut out the noise. And the noise, because that is expectations or false idealized lifestyles that we kind of create in their minds or it just subconsciously seeps into us. And so I think cutting out noise is so important to whether you are just trying to connect with your body or just trying to find your truth. So I'm planning to take a two week break and going into, it, I was like, no, like I need to post and I need to respond and I need to, but there really is no need for that. And so, yeah, I'm just taking this break. And I've fallen out of my morning routine that I really, I really love getting up really early in the morning and practicing yoga and taking my time to eat breakfast, getting ready and then getting to work and maybe even taking a walk. And it's like that, having that space that's that tone for the day. And I also feel pressure that I have to always have that morning routine and be that perfect role model because this is what I teach. But to be honest, I fall out of it too. And I, would, I do want to get back into it because I think it's really helpful for my mental health. 
and overall well-being. So, but everyone has their own mental health routines or what works for them and what doesn't. I don't think everyone has to have a routine, right? Some people are completely happy not having a morning routine and waking up early. Some people can just sleep in till 10 o'clock and be content and that's okay. You don't have to have a certain way that everyone else is telling you that you need to do. So that's just something that works for me and you don't have to do a certain way as long as it's working for you. Yeah, I really love that. And thank you for just being transparent. We can't uphold these routines all the time and it's okay to give ourselves permission to do that as well. And I think just being aware is also great in that aspect. And I think for me personally, I, as a mother and just as a woman and definitely as an Asian woman, I've always struggled to give myself permission to take a break. And that's something I've been working on a lot in therapy to just say, okay, this is my space. I am not going to work and I uh, have to carve out the time and really hold myself accountable and not give myself negative feedback. Oh, you're being lazy. You could be doing this and this needs to get done. And there's piles of laundry that need to be folded and all of that and to-do lists and they're not going anywhere, but I've had to literally write down like, <laughs> the time that I spend away from doing that will actually help me and will actually help to recharge and it will not be a loss. So that's something that I think a lot of us struggle with in terms of giving ourselves permission, setting those boundaries, holding ourselves accountable. And as for social media, I also really struggle with that where there's this dichotomy of needing to spend time on it for work but then also knowing that it doesn't serve me in a lot of ways and Mm -hmm. trying to figure out, okay, well, how can I use it to foster real human authentic connection and, but then not get sucked into the vortex of just self doubt. And as you said, the unconscious language of what we're telling ourselves, oh, I don't look like, my life doesn't look like this person's life, or I don't have this many likes or followers, or just all of the ways that we feel like we can fall short when we go on social media. And I don't have an answer necessarily, but I can say like, I can (laughs) relate to it. And it's something that I think particularly as women and as entrepreneurs, we really um, struggle with trying to figure out, especially in the time of pandemic, How do we connect with others without going on social media, but then trying to serve ourselves at the same time and protect our own energy? Right. Because social media is where we connected. We would not have met each other if we were not on this platform and we wouldn't be able to share our own stories and what we do and help people. So there's so much benefit to social media. So that's why it makes it even harder. (laughs) But I think taking breaks and not having to feel like you have to pose every single day or all the time, it's completely acceptable to do that, you know? So yeah, it's the same thing. It's entrepreneurial, it's dieting, it's the way we take care of ourselves and putting you first. Yeah. Yes. And it is something that we we do have to work hard on, but I think that Mm -hmm. The way that you've described your approach to eating and really it's not just eating, it's the whole body wellness is really exciting and refreshing in that it really centers on core values and not adhering to others' expectations. And that way your happiness really starts from within. I did have another question on, you know, when I first saw intuitive eating, I thought about my own family and I have two young daughters. And and if you ask them, what they intuitively want to eat in the morning, it's cookies and chocolate and, you know, just <laughs> anything that is carby and, and delicious. And I think a lot of us, we, we kind of struggle with that, right? We are, our intuition is to find comfort in food. Mm-hmm. And so what is your approach to that when you're working with clients who, for example, may want to eat healthier and eat more mindfully, but also like to enjoy things that are often on kind of that like naughty list of dietitians. What do you prescribe for them? 
Yeah, so I think it's really important to no longer have the bad and good list, right? If you're trying to change the way you see food, right? If you are, if there's a lot of tension around food and you're trying to restrict food and it's hard for you and you're in this vicious cycle of maybe binge eating or emotional eating, feeling guilty, restricting, and then binging again. If, if that's a cycle that you're trying to get out of, then it's really important that you neutralize foods, not pl placing labels on good and bad foods. So if you're, and if you're trying to send that message to your children, I actually encourage you to be like, okay, we'll have cookies for breakfast. Because if you say no and say cookies aren't good for you, it's not breakfast food, then that creates rules around food. And then it's like, oh, I can't have cookies, right? I can only have cookies when I deserve it or when it's the appropriate time because it's not good. And then that kind of creates this unbalanced relationship. And if we can neutralize all foods, then we want the foods when we want it, right? So sometimes we'll crave fruit because we want you know, something juicy and we want that tanginess or we want those, uh, the body is craving those minerals, right? And so I think it's really important that your body, you're giving what your body wants in that moment. And sugar can be really hard because sugar can give that, can continue to have you wanting that. But if you are saying, okay, go ahead and have it and be kind of nonchalant about the fact that your daughters are eating something sweet, then it's not going to be exciting, super exciting to have it be accessible. And then if they say they want, you want, I want vegetables, be like, okay, there are some vegetables, not, oh my God, good job. You're having vegetables. Okay, great. And it's, I think it's like in France, People have wine on the table and kids can drink it, mm -hmm. right? If you have, if you are able to access wine at any age, then you're not going to go crazy at 21 like we do in the U.S., like I did. Okay. <laughs> so it's just about, again, taking morality out of food. Right? I'm not saying, okay, you deserve to have this. Oh, you did a good job. Now you can have a candy bar. Why can't you have a candy bar, something that's bad for you when you did something good? So taking that confusion out, I think, is really important. And also showing that you have a healthy relationship with food because kids are watching. Yeah, they're watching everything. I mean, everything. <laughs> <laughs> they're repeating everything. I was like, where, where, where did you hear that from? I really love how you describe that because I see a lot of parallels to um, between neutralizing emotions around food and neutralizing emotions in general, which I think also ties into our background and our culture with our families assigning success or failure around, mm -hmm. oh, you're angry, oh, you're crying, oh, mm -hmm. you're sensitive, and not normalizing those feelings, not even allowing those feelings to be experienced. Mm -hmm. And I love that the same approach can be um, taken to food. And I think it's, it is such an important thing to just normalize the full spectrum. And to, as you mentioned, kind of take away that stigma and that forbidden rule approach to food. So I definitely want to try that with my girls. And I think even us adults can definitely benefit from that as well, because we do get a lot of messaging around whether it's carbs or red meat or just anything, right? There's so many categories of food that are bad or we're supposed to avoid and all of that. And it really creates a lot of stress and creates a lot of negative emotions around Absolutely. The choice of food. And in that similar vein, I'm curious, what do you, how do you approach it with clients who are struggling with their body image? What kinds of messages can we say to ourselves about our body, whether it's transforming some of the negative self-talk that we have or the, the body dysmorphia that we have? How can we transform that and create healthier habits in how we talk to ourselves? Yeah, and this is this is a tricky one. So it's really about unblocking and unlearning what we've picked up along the 
way since childhood. So when I work with my clients, we we, we assess their relationship with food and we go back into childhood. How did your parents eat? How did your parents talk about their weight, right? How did your parents tell you to eat? Did you have rules? Did they let you eat certain foods? And if you have certain patternings, then where did that come from? And does that serve you? Is that true? And so I think it's really important that we're questioning our beliefs, right? And so first it's that acknowledgement. And then we have to accept also our bodies, our body image. Maybe we are this in this body and it's not something we can really change, at least not in the expense of losing our mental health over, right? So if we want to be have peace with our bodies, we also have to accept this body that does so much for us. Our body is not for show. It's not for acceptance, right? It's this body that carries our soul. And we want, it's so important to keep it healthy, to nourish it. It's something that we're born with and we are in this body until the day we die. How can we be hating it? How can we hurt it, right? It's what allows us to walk, to go to the places and do all the things that we love. And if we are criticizing and constantly judging every, you know, battle scar, whether it's coming from having a baby or it's just your natural growth, whatever you went through, or even if you didn't go through, which is just your body. And why be so critical about something that houses you? This is the one thing that you have, right, in your lifetime. So... It is tricky to let go of how we want to look and to achieve beauty standards, but it's just being compassionate, right, for yourself, taking care of yourself as you would take care of your friends and family. Think about the language that you use for your body. Would you say those things to your friends, mm. right? If we're saying, oh, I'm so fat, or I need to lose weight, or my stomach is too big. Would you say those things to someone else? Definitely not, right? Why would you, why is it okay that you are saying those things to yourself? So actively changing the language and rewiring your brain is, is so important. It takes time, but it's possible to unlearn and to be able to accept yourself. You don't have to completely love your body, right? It's okay. I think very few people actually love their body, but it's really about being neutral about your body. Your body is just your body, right? It's not necessarily being body positive. It's the goal, I think, is to be neutral, right? I think being positive means, oh, this is, I'm, I'm happy with my body because I'm this way. I love my body because of this. Well, no, what if we can neutralize it so that there's, it doesn't really matter, right? Whether you, are at your ideal weight or, or ideal size or not. Wow, I think that's so revolutionary, particularly here in the US where there is this huge you know, push for body positivity. And I, I think there's a lot of great conversations happening around that. But I think, and I do think if this is also culturally specific to Asian Americans, is that even just working towards a position of neutrality seems far more within reach and perhaps, as you mentioned, more healthy for our own mental well-being because we're not assigning a value to it. It's mm -hmm. merely the carrier, uh, and not just merely, but it's, it's doing a lot for us, but it is simply a physical manifestation of our souls and our brains and our minds. And it's almost like you created this trinity of neutrality around emotions, food, and the body. And maybe that neutrality is that mindfulness as well. But I think that is such a revolutionary concept, particularly for us women who want to embrace the body positive movement, but also wonder how to do so realistically within our own 
lines when we might not be used to looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying like, wow, you look amazing. And all of that, you know, giving ourselves affirmations. And I think if you are able to do that, that's wonderful. But for some of us, it might be harder than for others. So I think that's a great point in terms of maintaining that neutrality. And I also wanted to um, circle back to what you were saying about really evaluating your clients' ways they grew up with food, because I can definitely relate to that. And I see that coming up now, particularly as a parent trying to raise young children to eat healthfully and mindfully. And I grew up in a very strict household where there was no junk food and there wasn't any candy or soda allowed. And whereas my, my husband grew up in a very different type of environment where all of that food was allowed. So we've also seen our own differences in how we um, normalize or encourage the eating mm -hmm. of quote junk food and all of that stuff so my last mm -hmm. question is really just around like junk food is that is that a thing in your approach or is, is all food kind of on the table with intuitive eating yeah so all food is on the table for me personally i eat i eat everything i'm a dietitian i'm a yoga teacher i eat meat i eat sugar i eat fast food, I eat healthy food, right? So I don't have any judgment towards any particular diets. I don't have any feeling towards veganism or plant-based diets or different types of diets. If it works for you, I think that's great, right? If, it, if you are able to follow that diet and you're happy, your body feels great and it's not stressful, then good for you. But if you're struggling and trying to restrict yourself, then I think we need to take a look at that. If you're someone who's saying, well, sugar is not good for you, how can you say that, that, you know, it's it's okay to have those things? If you're someone who has a really healthy relationship with food and you want to take out sugar and you're able to do that and it's not, it's a no brainer, then yes, please do it. Like all organic and, you know, no sugar or whatever, and you can do it. Okay, great. But if you have this struggle with food and it, you are demoralizing, like if you're saying sugar is bad for you, but you really want it and you just binge and you feel bad about it and guilty and you cheat it, then that we need to reassess that and we need to start giving yourself permission to bring that back into your diet. And once you are able to have a healthy relationship with the sugar or whatever it is, then maybe it's you can take the next steps to reevaluate what is healthy for you, what works for you. Yeah. So that's my approach. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's really nice that you have such an individualized approach to everyone. And it shows that our relationship with food and our bodies is quite complicated. And it, there's different factors for everybody. That's really refreshing to hear as well that you do not restrict yourself in terms of saying, I only follow a certain kind of diet or this is good, this is bad. So I really think that's a wonderful way to heal our relationships with food. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing your journey, your insights with us today. I definitely feel like we could talk for hours about it. So thank you so <laughs> much. And, um, I wish you best of luck in Japan and let us know if you ever have any retreats here stateside. I'm sure our listeners would love to attend. So thank you so much, Mayuko. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I, I love your podcast. I think what you do is amazing. And you're such a great interview too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>